Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our final keynote speaker of the day. I'm very excited to introduce Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. Many of you may know Commissioner Rosenworcel uh, from her many roles in uh, the communications uh, sphere uh, as former senior legal counsel to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee and as legal advisor to former FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. She truly recognizes that communication services are powerful forces in the lives of everyday Americans. And she's worked tirelessly to improve educational opportunities for students everywhere and to continually enhance our public safety. Important to us, Commissioner Rosenworcel also recognizes the importance of spectrum policy, and she's championed the development of a spectrum auction schedule to help guide 5G deployments. So we're very fortunate that she's joined us today. Everyone, please help me in welcoming Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. All right, good afternoon or good evening to my friends from the East Coast. Um, it's great to be here in sunny Los Angeles for the 2018 gathering of Mobile World Congress Americas. Now everything about this gathering leaves me energized about the wireless opportunities ahead, whether that's the promise of 5G, the advances in artificial intelligence, and virtual reality, or the growth of not just the internet of things, the internet of everything. And just being here makes me more convinced than ever that the future belongs to the connected. But you know, that wasn't always so clear. It was 15 years ago that a bright-eyed Chris Anderson published an article in Wired describing the possibilities of what he called the internet in the air. Back then, this was the stuff of dreams. Any one of us might have said, sure, that'll be possible when we have self-driving cars on the road. But look at where we are today. So I want to take a cue from Chris Anderson's effort a decade and a half ago and talk about the future. Not what's around the bend, but what's far out. In other words, I want to go there and you can mark my words, I'm going to be the first commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission to talk about 6G wireless service. And if you're thinking, I am too early on this one, consider this. A few months ago, Google Trends rated 6G as the 17th most looked up phrase in its search engine. On a recent investor call, one Fortune 500 company spoke on at length about its research into 6G service. And take note, the Minister of Industry and Information Technology in China has already made the official pronouncement that the nation will be the first in 6G. Of course, you could say, admittedly on pretty good authority, that no one yet knows what 6G will entail, fair enough. I mean, we're only in the early days of 5G service with the world by and large waiting for its higher speeds and lower latencies to grace our presence. But that doesn't stop futurists from making predictions. So here are mine. The sixth generation of wireless service will feature terahertz frequency networks and spatial multiplexing. And to do this, we are going to need an unprecedented level of network densification. So imagine base stations radically miniaturized and embedded all around us. This will make it possible to have hundreds and even thousands of simultaneous wireless connections with as much as a thousand times higher capacity than what we expect with 5G service. Finally, while 5G applications are expected to evolve around single beam approach to data transfer, 6G could be designed around hundreds of simultaneous beams, yielding much higher data rates. You got that? It's out there. But getting from here to there won't be simple. In fact, I think it will require Washington to reassess some policies it holds dear and considers tried and true. So that's what I want to spend the rest of my time discussing today. I want to talk about three things we should revisit for the spectrum policy of the future. And that's spectrum valuation, spectrum auction, and spectrum distribution. So first up, valuation. And I admit this is some wonky stuff. 
Spectrum valuation may be more art than science, but it's clear our airwaves will play a big role in the economic future. However, before we get there, I think we have a problem. I think we are going to be waylaid by Washington accounting. So let me explain. And the best way to do this is to actually reference the infrastructure of the past. The Federal Highway Act became law in 1956, and of course that's a full four decades before the Telecommunications Act. And it featured a bold plan to connect the nation with a new highway system to support our economic and national security. It was not cheap. But the billions invested have reaped us rewards for generations. And this system of national roads was the great connectivity challenge of the past. What distinguishes it from the one we will have in the future with wireless that reaches everywhere is that the effort to develop a highway system did not require a pit stop at the Congressional Budget Office, or CBO. That's because six decades ago, it did not exist. However, in Washington, CBO now scores every spending bill. That means it takes every big idea about how we use our airwaves and it subjects it to a grinding analysis of its review on the budget and the deficit. And this analysis is important. It's useful. But in practice, these estimates can hamper creative ideas about long-term infrastructure investment, including how we free more of our airwaves to support economic growth. This is already an issue today, but it is going to be an even bigger constraint in the future. Over time, it will be especially challenging for unlicensed spectrum to make it through this filter. That's because unlicensed use yields no funds in the scoring process, even though we all know Wi-Fi adds billions to the national economy. But that's not all. This process can harm our ability to identify airwaves for licensed services too. When auction values are not right, relocation costs are wrong, or assumptions are built into the baseline that don't truly affect what is happening, we're going to have a problem. And it's a problem that is going to slow our ability to get airwaves to market, create jobs, and offer innovative new services. So we're going to have to find a better way to manage these balance sheets. In fact, the infrastructure of the future depends on it. So second, I want to talk about auctions. It was more than two decades ago that we took the academic ideas of Ronald Coase and reimagined how we would distribute our airwaves. Instead of doling out specific licenses for specific uses, largely based on political cues, the FCC ushered in a new era of spectrum auctions, selling access to bidders and letting them use it for whatever purposes they wished. It's really hard to remember now, but the idea of auctions was once mocked by experts, opposed by industry, and dismissed by policymakers. But if you look at it in the rearview mirror, we kind of did okay. The FCC's held nearly 90 auctions, it's issued more than 44,000 licenses, and it raised more than $140 billion in revenue. In fact, our efforts have become a model for regulators worldwide. But as all those Mutual fund ads say, past performance is not always an indicator of future success. To be clear, auctions are still the best tool we have for the distribution of exclusive rights. Yet we're heading into territory where our national providers are bigger and fewer in number. That means the power of using auctions as a distributive tool is more complicated. And without changes, auctions could devolve into retail sales. In short, our auction playbook needs an update. So what would that look like? I think going forward, we have to commit to the idea that successful auctions have many bidders. We need to consider how the size, duration, and set of rights that come with a license can increase the range of actors willing to participate in our auctions. We also need to put a premium on auctioning multiple spectrum bands together rather than offering them premium one at piecemeal, one at a time. In other words, we need to structure our auctions to increase the universe of spectrum interests if we want this tool to continue to be viable in the future. And one more thought on auctions. Our use of reverse auctions does not have to be confined to the 600 megahertz band. 
Going forward, we need to consider how to use this tool elsewhere. And in the near term, I think we should explore a voluntary incentive auction in the 2.5 gigahertz band with excess proceeds used to support internet access for the 12 million students who lack it at home and struggle with nightly schoolwork. That would mean that the future of the 2.5 gigahertz band could reflect its educational use in the past. We could call it the homework gap auction. All right, third and finally, I want to talk about spectrum distribution. Our spectrum system of access today has this binary quality. Either it's licensed or unlicensed. Either you have exclusive use or shared access. And either you have federal or non-federal use. But that duality is not a normal condition. It is not the result of physics. It's the result of an intentional set of policy choices that can create scarcity when there are other choices we make that can create abundance. Now that's some lofty stuff, so what I'm really talking about is making sure dynamic spectrum access becomes the norm rather than the exception by the time 6G heads our way. If we assume demands on our airwaves continue to grow at a breakneck pace, now's the time to explore sharing paradigms that can make it possible to have a range of activities in a single spectrum band. Three years ago, the FCC got this effort started with its work in the 3.5 gigahertz band. And that's stalled, but I want to focus today not on the reasons it stalled, but the fundamental ideas behind that band. We took 150 megahertz of spectrum and opened it up to a mix of government licensed and unlicensed uses. Then we proposed a spectrum access database system to dynamically manage all these different types of traffic. And that multi-tiered approach to spectrum access isn't just unprecedented, it's creative, it's efficient, it's forward-looking. It permits higher powered secondary transmission at times when primary users of the band are inactive, and it also promotes better collaboration among unlicensed users to more efficiently use spectrum resources. So this is new, and if it works, we're going to have to look for other opportunities to export this model. And even better, we could take it further into the future through new technologies that enable smarter use of more decentralized dynamic spectrum access to needs. And I mean blockchain. Now blockchain, of course, involves distributed databases that can securely be updated without central intermediaries. That makes them ideal for a bunch of uses. And everyone and their mother has a blockchain idea right now. So here's mine. Instead of having a centralized database to support shared access in specific spectrum bands, we could explore the use of blockchain as a lower cost alternative. And if this effort succeeds, this could reduce the administrative expense of dynamic access systems and increase spectral efficiency. We could foster new hierarchies of band-specific rights and increase the opportunities for lightweight leasing. Plus, the public quality of recording this information using distributed ledger technology could help expose patterns that inspire new technical innovation and even change the way we use wireless. All right, I am going to conclude my futuristic and super wonky musings here. But let me caution, 6G service is not as far off as you think. A terahertz network with massive densification featuring simultaneous beams may sound like the stuff of science fiction. But the future has a way of sounding odd when you first hear about it. Remember, it was radical when Chris Anderson suggested in Wired 15 years ago that the golden age of wireless was coming. Now, more than a decade into the smartphone revolution, no one doubts his clairvoyance. But the task for spectrum policymakers today is to prepare for that future. And I think the best way to do that is to take a fresh look at some of the policy practices of the past. Thank you.